<laughs> well, it is indeed Soap Sunday, and so uh, I, I want to give you an opportunity to come up and, and share uh, what God has been stirring and putting in your heart. Who would like to come up and share first? <laughs> come on. It's like pulling teeth sometimes. No. Not usually. No, not usually. I think so. No, it wasn't. Sorry. Testing. Okay. I can hear myself now. Good morning, Grace. So I have two scriptures. Um, and so I'm just going to go ahead and start. So my soap, my S is James 1.21. Therefore, get rid of all moral filth and the evil that is so prevalent and humbly accept the word planted in you, which can save you. And then I have Luke 8.13. Those on the rocky ground are the ones who receive the word with joy when they hear it, but they have no root. They believe for a while, but in the time of testing, they fall away. So here's my observation. Last Sunday during worship, I asked the Lord to help me communicate better to my loved ones, um, to communicate honestly and to speak truths. Specifically, I want to stop speaking half-truths and to stop omitting information because omitting information is just like lying. So on Monday, I started a devotional, which I had never done. The Lord told me I had to on my phone in an app. It was kind of weird. And the first scripture I read was James 1.21. So I went back and read James 1.19 through 21 so that I could apply more context. And I read, My dear brothers and sisters, take note of this. Everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry, because human anger does not produce the righteousness that God desires. Therefore, get rid of all moral filth and the evil that is so prevalent and humbly accept the word planted in you, which can save you. This is when I understood that God was not only answering my prayer, he was bringing into light the darkness that is still within me. I realized that when I asked to be a better communicator, I made it all about me and not about the people receiving my message and definitely not about God's words. He said, stop, listen, speak slowly, recognize your moral filths and get rid of it, humble yourself, and I have your back because your words, which are really my words, are already inside you and they will save you if you let them. Later that day I read Luke 8.13. Those on the rocky ground are the ones who receive the word with joy when they hear it, but they have no root. They believe for a while, but in a time of testing, they fall away. So I read the parable of the sower for clarification. And God then asked me, do you see what I'm saying here? He continued to explain that because the seed in this story is the word of God, and everyone has the capacity to hear the word of God, I have to look at where I have planted my words of God. And because I have to humble myself and be honest, I know that I have I had planted the, my seeds on rocky grounds. Um, so where his seeds will have no chance of growing roots is what I recognized earlier this week. And so every seed will try to survive, but it's the external things that may deflect the seed from persevering. Um, the word of God is within me, but depending on what I allow myself to get influenced by, I will be affected by listening and allowing his words to persevere through me. So this is when I got my answer to my, my communication request. God said, why haven't you let me set roots in the entirety of your life? So here's my application. Um, this was a lot to process, um, but this is what I'm walking away with. So I have to acknowledge the evils that's all within me that manifest themselves in anger, pride, fear, and resentment. I got to give all those things up. <laughs> I have to acknowledge them, um, 
or acknowledging them doesn't make me a bad person. It just makes me more honest with myself and therefore honest with others. Um, I have to apply humility into my life. And when I read this, um, this is actually kind of an application in, po in process, but I have to keep reminding myself of empowerment and to be reminded that his words already dwell within me. And so having a constant reminder that God has my back will reassure me and not make me feel fearful when I'm communicate, communicating with others. I have to abandon any credit towards my wisdom um, and give all the credit to God because it's his wisdom. Um, and again, stop, listen, speak slowly, let him take root in all aspects of my life, not, where just, not just where I allow him, and so that I will be saved. So here's my prayer. And this is something different that I've been doing. Um, I am going to read the serenity prayer, and then I'm going to add to it. I've been doing this all week. Um, it's been really encouraging to me. So, oops, sorry. God, grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, courage to change the things I can, and wisdom to know the difference, living one day at a time, enjoying one moment at a time, accepting hardship as the pathway to peace, taking as he did this sinful world as it is, not as I would have it, trusting that he will make all things right if I surrender to his will, so that I may be reasonably happy in this life and supremely happy with him forever in the next. God, I am so thankful to have you in my life. Thank you for answering my prayers, for reminding me that I am loved and that arriving, arriving in life is not something that is possible because the journey with you is constant. And whenever I feel deflated for whatever reason, remind me that I have the ability to surrender completely to you. You can have it all, Lord. Amen. Goodness. Thank you, Ioni. That was good. Excellent. Who's next? Who would like to share now? Jim? I see that shirt way back there. Yes, you should. The passage that I was reading, and it, it kind of pertains to, to yesterday and maybe the first Saturday ever since I got back from Peru. Since yesterday I was in the prison for the day. Uh, it's Mark 6, and it's that Jesus leaves somewhere, and I didn't go back to Mark 5 to, <laughs> to try to figure out where he was leaving from. But he goes back to his hometown where everybody identifies him with who his father is, uh, but thinking Joseph, and that he was a carpenter, and he was a bunch of things. Uh, the theme that seems to be recurrent on the first Saturday as we go out for supper at night, the volunteers, is kind of a cynical one. Uh, having gone in there for 32 years plus, uh, it's that you assume that these people will never change or something, or that for a lot of them, they have been in and out of the place. So they're Christians where they are. This is verified by the people around them. And then it's that they uh, wind up going out and doing the same things that they used to. Uh, the issue for me with Mark 6 is, is that Jesus grew up in a place. And then he assumed his ministry. And then the people, when he went back there, didn't recognize him for who he was. Uh, the changes that come about in us, since we're supposed to be transformed into the likeness of Christ, uh, those things are resisted often by the people around us, our families, for the guys that in the prison. They go back to the same neighborhoods quite often. Uh, they, they're surrounded by the same gangs they were members of, and they don't let them out of there easily either. So it's that these things don't, they re, it causes the changes that God is trying to bring about in us to be resisted, and yet at the same time, what we wind up having, having to seek uh, is uh, that transformation anyway. For those of us who see people around us, whether it's in the prison or out here, it is that it is praying into the changes that we desire in them so that they will be transformed into the likeness of Christ and not resisting it at all, but being hopeful uh, that those things will come, will come about and be permanent. 
Uh, for me, I was on a retreat last weekend, and so I wasn't here. Uh, but somebody was sharing some cynicism, and I told him that it reminded me a little bit of a family that had twins, and one of them was super optimistic, and the other one was super pessimistic. And the pessimistic one was kind of dangerous to all everything around him, so he broke a lot of things. Uh, so they took him to a psychiatrist, took them to a psychiatrist, and he had a solution. So he put the pessimistic, destructive kid in with all of the latest toys. It only took him about an hour to break them all. Uh, and then he took the super optimistic kid and put him in a room that was full of horse manure. And as the kid rooted around and still looked happy and hopeful, it was, okay, what's going on here? And what the kid wound up telling them was, there's got to be a pony in here somewhere. <laughs> in Christ, we have much hope and many promises. And we wind up having to let those be realized in our lives, but we have to because we're all called to ministry, Ephesians 4. We're all called to be equipped to do the ministry. So we all have to expect to assume that. But to a great extent, it is coming against those things that are the prejudices, against the people in whom God wants to work. And we need to encourage those things and not discourage them. Uh, but we need to be able to have his eyes to see and ears to hear, to recognize the opportunities. My prayer. <laughs> I think I got the other three in. Okay. Uh, Father in heaven, fill us with your Holy Spirit, giving us eyes to see and ears to hear. Help us to be blessed with the joy of your presence and let it overflow into the lives of the people around us. Let the expectations and the hopes that you have for us all, because you know the plans you have for us. So let those things be what are in our vision for the lives of the people around us. Help us to encourage those things so that we see many transformed into your likeness that otherwise would be discouraged and fall away. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, Jim. Good. Amen. Who's next? Karen, I know you've got one. You don't have to wait till nobody else responds. Thanks. Uh huh. <clears throat> Let me get to the scripture here. Yeah. I have a little testimony too. I gave it last week. But there was a part I had asked the Lord before when I sat down here early and asked him, Lord, is this the church you want me to be in? And I, I just, you know, I just expect that he'll, he'll tell me. Well, we were asked, people were asked about something you had, a word of knowledge, and various people stood up and you said, go and pray over them. And, or put your hand on them, that's what you said. And so I went behind, it was behind me, and I put my hand on it, on her. And there was power coming from her in my arm. And the scripture that came to my mind was, um, it says, you'll be healed by your, what's that scripture? It says um, that in your healing, you will be healed. So like, when we pray for people, then he heals us. I could feel the power coming out of her. And, and actually I had some, some headache. And as I was holding on, it was going away. So it was, it was amazing. So when you know that you're playing your hands on someone, even though they may be having some illness, they're seeking healing and power will come out of them. So praise the Lord. Okay, this is a very, you know this scripture. But I'm going to read it. I suppose I have six minutes. But this takes up almost one and a half minutes. It's 1 Corinthians 13. And we've been talking about love a lot. And why I chose this, because I really wanted to just share something with you, let you know a little bit about who I am. But <clears throat> I was, I've noticed in this election year that there is a spirit that's rampant. I think it's not just this one. It's usually every, every time we have a major presidential election. It's anger and division. And it seems like it's worse than it's ever been. And, and Paul was teaching in 1 Corinthians 12 and before the division that was in the church. And then he says, there's a better way. And he starts out. 
If I speak in the tongues of men and or of angels, but do not have love, I am only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have a faith that can move mountains, but do not have love, I am nothing. If I give all my I possess to the poor and give over my body to the hardship and that I may boast, but do not have love, I gain nothing. Now the next part he talks about what love is, and this is where I got a little bit introspective. I thought, how can Paul talk about this when he was a man that went and terrorized the churches and, and he was an enemy of the church? He witnessed Stephen's murder and consented to it. And so he says this. So he had a real attitude problem. And I have to say, as I read this, I have to say I have one too. Love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. It does not disown, dishonor others. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in the evil in evil but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Love never fails, but where there are prophecies, they will cease. Where there are tongues, they will be stilled. Where there is knowledge, it will pass away. For we know in part and we prophesy in part, but when but when completeness comes, what is in part disappears. What I, when I was a child, okay, this before I get here, this is a part I didn't ever understand. And I've heard this message on 1 Corinthians 13 often, um, not like every week, but I mean like at other churches. And when one pastor was teaching, he says, put your name and say, Karen is patient, Karen is kind, it does, Karen is not envious, she does not boast. And it was like, yuck, I could see all that I wasn't. <laughs> and then I thought, okay, there's got to be another way. So <clears throat> as we go down here, it says, well, we know in part, see, love never fails, but where there are prophecies, said that, okay. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part. Okay, we did that. When I was a child, okay. Now, this got me thinking, because Paul was once a child, in the understandings of, of Christ or God. And so he says, when I was a child, I talked like a child, I thought like a child, I reasoned like a child. And when I became a man, I put away the things of childhood behind me. For now we see only a reflection as in a mirror. Then we shall see face to face. Now I know in part that I shall know fully, even as I am fully known. And now these three remain, faith, hope, and love, but the greatest of these is love. Now this is, this is still an area where we're trying to grow in, being ones that do not bring division, do not have anger, do not curse, and, <clears throat> and even though you might even have it in your head, how do you really change? Well, as he says, it's like looking in a mirror. Who's in the mirror? Well, James talks about a mirror being the Word of God, but I believe the mirror is Jesus. That when we look into the mirror, because Jesus is the one who redeemed humanity. He brought us into a new level of being. We became, uh, we, beca we got a new identity. We have life. We have love. We have peace. We have these things. And so what we do is when Paul saw, and I've always thought, oh, it's when we get to heaven, we'll see Jesus, and then we'll be like him. No, it's here. We see Jesus when we sing the song. I'll tell you, there's such a sweet spirit in here. I just love it. And I have to say, when we keep our focus on Jesus, then we're going to be able to be able to allow him who's in us to do the works that he desires us to do. And so all we need to do is like what you were saying, is it Carmen that was up here? Um, Ioni. Ioni. Okay. I, I'm still learning names, and I just really loved what you had to say. And, you know, you're trying to stamp those seeds into your heart. And, and, and what you do, you know, look at Jesus. When Jesus, they brought the adulterous woman, what did he do? 
Did he condemn? No. He, and so when I look at Jesus in, in the Gospels, I see, oh, I don't condemn people. <laughs> I don't condemn them for their bad behavior. And so what we do is we, we, we show them another way. And that's what he says. I show you another way. My prayer is not only for us to reflect Jesus, it's also that our nation would be undivided. And I just want to pray for our nation. And so let's just pray together. Father, in the name of Jesus, we just thank you for our nation. It's been founded on the, the name that God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all, but Yes, Father, we say that we are undivided. We are a nation that lifts up God, and we know who God is. His name is Jesus. And we thank you. You are the way, the truth, and the life, and that we will be that to others, that we will point them to the way. We will reveal to them the truth, and we will give them your love. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, Karen. Good. Amen. Who else would like? Dave, have you got a soap? This is good. Isn't it good to hear what God is stirring in other people in the body? Yes, I can hardly wait to see um, Soap Curl go into action this afternoon. It's going to be awesome. Um, as many of you, I'm sure. So we have the same dad, we have the same spirit, we have the same savior. How many of you, the Holy Spirit's been speaking to you about surrender? Okay, I see those hands. So that's what God's been speaking to me about. And um, my wife and I have been praying earnestly that God would bring us to the freedom of complete surrender. This brings, brings me to our, our scripture, Karen and I. Romans 8, 28, and, I, and this is a living translation. But we know that for those who love him, those who are called in agreement with his purpose. I thought that's an interesting word to use, in agreement with his purpose. God makes all things work together for good. Everything. Motorcycles taking off. <laughs> children getting stitches. Um, Yesterday I was working in some slop, cleaning up stuff in the backyard, and I was trying to break up this old plastic to throw it away, and it had, I don't want to gross anybody up, but it had like, you know, worms and earwigs and spiders and stuff in it. And, and when I snapped, it blew up in my face. I had this stuff splatter all over my face and my shirt. My son thought it was, or our grandson, Brace, it thought it was really cool. It was awesome. <laughs> but when things blow up, God says that the pieces will be fit together in accordance with his perfect plan and purpose. Yes. I might see a mess. I might see something broken. But God sees something mending. And God to see something working together for good. So that's my observation. Love for God, love for others, leads the way. And every step we take with every person that we meet, love directs our spirit, then it directs our soul, then it directs our mind, and then it directs our words. That's how Jesus lived. He always spoke the truth in love. And I, I want to do that too. His divine purpose for us, for me, certainly then is that God will make and cause all things to fit together for his purposes as long as I surrender 
in alignment and agreement with him. So the application is loving Heavenly Father. Help me to not look at the circumstances of life. And I know David's preached this. I've heard him preach this for many years. <laughs> Don't be looking down. Be looking up. No matter what the circumstances are, no matter how dark they appear, especially if they appear dark, look up. Dwell on, dwell on, or perch on, or rest in what is true, honorable, whatever is just, whatever is lovely, whatever is kindly spoken, whatever is lofty, and whatever is worthy of praise. Focus and refocus our minds on him and these things. Our prayer, loving and perfectly, thank you for that song, good, good Father Jack, I, I love that song. Loving and perfectly good, Heavenly Father, as we pray in accordance with your will. And feel free to join me in this. We submit to you. We repent of any sin that prevents us from walking in surrender and peace with you, God. Holy Spirit, we invite you right now to fill us afresh with your presence, with your love, joy, peace, patience, goodness, kindness, gentleness, faithfulness, and self-control. Help us to glorify you today in all that we say and do by the power of your love through the mighty spirit of Jesus in us. Amen. 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 Anyone else like to share a soap? Good stuff. How many have been encouraged already? Good stuff. Praise the Lord. Trying to decide whether to share a soap or preach. Yeah, I think so too. I, 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 don't, I don't have time to get wound up. John chapter 5. This was uh, our Bible reading uh, this week on Wednesday. And I, I was thinking about just, you know, we've been talking about how important intimacy with the Father is. And, and just that, that relationship with him. And so as, as I was reading this portion of scripture, I'm kind of looking at it through that lens. And I, uh, verses 16 and 17, John 5, For this reason the Jews persecuted Jesus and sought to kill him because he had done those things on the Sabbath. But Jesus answering them said, My father has been working until now and, and I have been working. So the, my observation is, is really looking at the context of what's happened here. Jesus happens to, to visit Solomon's porch and, and the five covered colonnades, you know, where, where sick people and lame people and blind people would gather together and they would wait for the water to be stirred. And then, and then whoever would get into the water first would get healed. And so there, there were all these people there waiting and Jesus just walks up to this guy and he says, do you want to be made whole? You know, it, it probably bothered the guy a little bit. Like, dude, that's why I'm here. Like, what's that? Yeah. No, no, it was Solomon's porch. And, and, and so here, here Jesus says, do you want to be made whole? And, and the guy, I'm going to paraphrase, the guy says, dude, that's why I'm here. 
That's why I come here every day. But I don't have anybody to help me get down to the water when it's stirred. By the time I get there, somebody already beats me. So he's probably wound up. And Jesus just says, get up, grab your bed, and get out of here. And so he gets up, grabs his bed, takes off out of there. Now, how many of you know there, there are sometimes religious people around church? And so he takes off with his, and, and some religious Jews said, you can't do that, it's the Sabbath. What's the matter with you? And he says, well, listen, the guy that healed me told me to pick up my bed and walk. And they said, well, who is this guy? Who told you that? And he says, I don't know. Uh, the, the, as soon as the, the crowds came, Jesus kind of disappeared. And, and so he didn't, didn't know who healed him. But then later that evening, uh, Jesus found him in the temple. And Jesus says to him, you've been made whole. Go, go and sin no more, lest something worse comes on you. Now he wasn't saying, dude, if you sin again, God is going to get you. <laughs> what he was saying is, don't do something that opens up your life and gives the, the enemy access to it. Don't do that. And so this guy, when he, when he realized Jesus, it was Jesus that healed him, he goes and tells these religious Jews that uh, it was Jesus and so they're ticked with Jesus because Jesus is, is violating the Sabbath and so they, they, they're, they're after Jesus and Jesus says these words to them we just read it my father has been working until now and I have been working can you imagine what he's, what he's saying is God doesn't even keep your Sabbath so I'm not going to God's working, so I'm working. Can you imagine? Now, they're not only ticked at him because he, he violates the Sabbath, but he, now they're mad at him because he calls God his Father. And then Jesus went on to say, you know, I, I only do the things that I see my Father doing. That's how this ministry operates. Can you see the importance of intimacy with the Father? Can you see that, that ministry is not me getting a good idea? Hey, let's go start a ministry, Dale. You know, it's not that. It, it's not a good idea. It's a God idea. Jesus didn't do good ideas. He, didn't, he waited to see what God was doing and then that's what he did. Whatever I see my father doing, that's what I do. That's ministry. Ministry is an overflow of intimacy with the father. <clears throat> and so that, that was kind of my observation. Is um, I'm just whipping through all these notes that I already went through. Um, it is that we really need to know the Father. It's the difference between saying, God, bless what I'm doing. And saying, God, what are you doing? Because I know it's blessed. There's a difference between trying to do something for God. Oh, I want to do something for God. Jesus, Jesus just found out what God was doing and joined him. He found out what God was up to. So ministry, <clears throat> we talked about it last week. God had called the nation of Israel into a place of intimacy with him. He called them, Exodus chapter 17, he called them to be a nation of priests. A whole nation that knew him intimately, that, that, that walked with him, that, that, that had unusual access to his presence. But in the very next chapter, I'm sorry, that was chapter 19. In the very next chapter, chapter 20, they have this encounter with God on the mountain and they hear thunder and the lightning and the sound of the trumpet and all these things. And, and they say to Moses, 
listen, this, uh, this, this just doesn't feel safe for us. Well, you talk to him. You don't seem to be afraid of him. Whatever he tells you, that's what we'll do. And so what transpired in those two chapters is they stepped away from the, the original calling on their life which was intimacy with God to a place of serving God at a distance. That's what religion is. It, it, is, it, it is obedience without relationship. It is like, like let, me, let me make God just a little more user friendly because dude... He's not a tame God. And so Jesus is, is, is we, we see his life exemplifying a relationship with the Father that was expressed in what he said and what he did. So the application is this. Jesus lived in such a place of intimacy with the Father that he only did what he saw the Father do. He only said what he saw the Father uh, or heard the Father say. His motivation for action was seeing what the Father was doing. Ministry requires intimacy with the Father. Ministry flows out of seeing what the Father is doing and hearing what the Father is saying. And, and, And... my observation or my application was I want to begin my every day with that thought. My, my life must flow out of intimacy with the Father. All ministry flows out of intimacy with the Father. You know, Jesus talked about abiding in Him and in this, this relationship uh, that He compared to a, a, a tree and branches. You are the branches, I am the vine. You know, if you abide in me, if you stay connected to the vine, the life of that vine will flow up and into the branches and cause there to be fruit. But see, Christianity is not me being a branch trying to bear fruit. Have you ever tried to bear fruit? (laughs) Come on, pop out there. Come on. the, 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 The job description of the branch was simply to stay connected to the vine. That's it. See, the, the, the fruitfulness would come automatically just by being connected to the vine. The job description of a branch is not to bear fruit. The job description of a branch is to stay connected to the vine. And fruit will be a natural byproduct. So I, I, I want to begin my everyday with this prayer. Father, I want to know you intimately. I want to see what you are doing so that I can join you. I I want to be led by you in such a way that I am moving in accordance with with your rhythms, with with, with your flowing. Father, I, I want this to be my prayer. Father, what are you doing today so that I can join you? What are you saying today so that I can release your word into people's lives? Thank you, Lord. That's my soap. No, no. I, unless you're clapping for all the soaps. Amen. Father, we just thank you for your presence. And Lord, there, there is a cry coming from our hearts to know you in a greater measure. Lord, we don't want religion. We don't want man-made stuff. We don't want to put you in a box where, where we can control you, where you are more user-friendly. We, we want you, God. We want your presence and, and all that that entails. Thank you, Father. Wow. You know, I, I feel like there's one area that God wants to minister to, to today and, and it's discouragement. Um, now everyone experiences discouragement but the last few days for you have been really tough and, and it's, it just seems like it's been intensified. There, there is, there's a heaviness that, that, that you've carried and sometimes you, you've felt 
pretty alone. I believe that God just wants to minister to you today by His presence, by His Spirit. Who, who, who's, who would say that, that, okay, go ahead and stand up if that's you. Just stand up wherever you are. And, and we're, we're just going to gather around everybody that's standing right now. Just... Are, are we, are, okay, if, if you're around somebody that's standing, please just stand up and we're just going to go lay hands on them. We're going to pray for them. I, I believe the Holy Spirit wants to release something into people's lives, into people's hearts today. It, 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 we're, <laughs> it, this is not a psych. You can't psych yourself out of, out of where you are. It, it, it's been a heaviness. It, it's been a struggle. And, and there's something inside of you that, that's been crying out to God. And I believe that this is God's answer. I, I believe he's responding to you right now in Jesus' name. Father, we just pray for everyone that stood to that, to that altar time, to that response. Father, everyone that stood, we just pray for them right now in Jesus' name. Father, we just come against the lies of the enemy. We come against the attack of the enemy. We break that off of their lives right now in Jesus' name. Just don't be afraid to pray out loud for them. Don't be afraid to say, in Jesus' name, I break that off of your life right now in the name of Jesus. And Lord, I pray for refreshing. I pray for the, the, just the refreshing rain of your spirit just to begin to fall on them and to renew them and to refresh them and to encourage them. Father, I pray for a spiritual strengthening to take place in their spirits right now in Jesus' name. Father, just pour out your grace. Let, lift that off of them right now in Jesus' name. Let, let there come a heavenly shift, a, a paradigm shift, a perspective shift, Lord, that will change the way they see things, Lord. That will allow them to see from your heart, from your perspective, Lord, in Jesus' name. Refresh. Refresh and encourage. Refresh and give life. Lord, we just thank you for what you're doing right now in Jesus' name. Now, I'm speaking to everyone that stood. Just, just, just receive. Don't struggle. Don't strive. Don't try to do anything. Just when you're receiving, you're receiving. Just receive what he wants to give you right now in Jesus' name. Some of you may feel like prophesying. Some of you may feel like just speaking the word into their lives. I, I just feel free to do that. I encourage you to do that. Speak life. Speak a word of encouragement. Prophesy in, into their life in Jesus' name. Lord, we just bless them right now. Let them be encouraged. Let them be refreshed. Let them be renewed in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Father. Just let body ministry happen right now. In Jesus' name. We just release life. We just bless them, Lord. In the name of Jesus. Thank you, Father. Whoa. Thank you, Lord. I want to invite the worship team to come up. I, I just want to close with a song today. <laughs> Thank you, Jesus. Can we, can we sing that last song? I mean, I, I like a lot of the songs you did today, and it wasn't easy to decide. But uh, as we worship him, I, I just, just stay in that received place. Let God just pour out his spirit on you today. In Jesus' name.
any need of any kind, if you need healing, if you need refreshing, whatever you need, there will be people up here that will be ready and willing to pray for you. Father, we thank you for what you're doing. Thank you for what you're doing in our hearts and in our lives, God. Thank you that you're calling us to a greater place of intimacy, of knowing you, Lord. Thank you for that, Lord. Pray you just bless everyone here today. Lord, let us walk out full of your presence, full of, uh, of you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Just a reminder that we're meeting at the park today at 1 o'clock. Going to have a potluck time together and then just a, a fun time of, of Olympics, uh, superhero water Olympics. God bless you, saints. Have a wonderful week.